So the LDS school team is very pleased to welcome our two speakers today, Anne-Marie Spence and Karen Bernil, who are presenting this afternoon a lovely presentation called Soaring After Primary, Morphing Into Meaning. The Ministry of Education has provided funding for the production of this webinar. Please note that the views expressed in this webinar are the views of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect those of the Ministry of Education nor the Learning Disabilities Association of Ontario. We will also be tweeting throughout the presentation today. I don't know if you found this webinar on Twitter or if you even follow us, but if you do, we'd love to for to have you join in the conversation. So you can find us at, at LD at school dot, um, which is our handle at the bottom of the screen. And we'll also be using the hashtag, hashtag LD webinar throughout. So you can find all the tweets that have to do with today's presentation. So that takes care of all the housekeeping for this afternoon. Let's get started with the fun of the actual presentation. Please join me in welcoming our two presenters for this afternoon. Anne-Marie Spence is currently a secondary school teacher in Southwestern Ontario. In 2022, she completed a six year secondment at the Provincial and Demonstration Schools branch, where she taught at Amethyst Demonstration School in both the elementary and secondary divisions followed by a role as central resource teacher for Ontario demonstration schools with a special focus on literacy. Having taught across all divisions, she's got a background in French immersion and special education. Karen Brunel is currently superintendent of education with Bruce Gray Catholic District School Board. She's worked for the past 27 years with various boards and has been seconded to the Ministry of Education as principal at Amethyst Demonstration School and is the executive director of the Provincial and Demonstration Schools branch. She's got a background in French immersion as well, as both a teacher and a principal, and has a special interest in reading instruction and special education. So with that being said, I'm going to turn the floor over to Anne-Marie and Karen now to show you their presentation. Great, thank you so much and welcome everyone. Anne-Marie and I are excited to be here with you. Today, we're gonna to focus on um, this part two of our workshop from this summer's Educators Institute on evidence-based reading instruction for grades four uh, up to 12 and beyond. So our first slide that we wanna go over is just kind of setting some focus is the, the Scarborough Reading Rope. It all starts with the reading rope and we wanna draw your attention to some further detail that we provided in the examples on this particular version of the reading rope. Our previous workshop, part one, focused on continuing to build word reading skills and morphology through word study. We touched in general terms on each part of the reading rope and spent a little extra time on decoding with multisyllabic word work and phonemic awareness, uh, sorry, morphemic awareness, and on the extreme importance of background knowledge overall and some strategies for vocabulary development as well as an overview of syntax. Today's workshop is gonna zero in on the work that we do in grades four to 12, in addition to the word study and morphemic analysis part that supports word level skills. Uh, so developing syntax and sentence level skills, which are language comprehension skills for both reading and writing. We're also gonna build some further knowledge around fluency and fluency instruction to connect the language comprehension skills that are being taught to the word reading skills that are continuing to be taught and reinforced at these grades. This is because we need to continue to build fluency along with language comprehension skills to support reading comprehension in general, and especially reading comprehension of more and more complex tests, texts, and that also supports writing. So the next slide that we have for you is uh, a slide that just kind of gives you an overview of when it is that we're teaching different parts of the reading rope. So starting in grade four, Text comprehension begins to depend more on content knowledge, vocabulary, and knowledge of expository text structures. People often ask what they need to teach and when, and so this graphic is designed to help you with that understanding um, that language comprehension is primarily done through oral language until students are fluent and automatic readers. And then this diagram is kind of like an instructional continuum. So it shows what parts of the reading rope need to be taught uh, as part of the regular classroom instruction at each grade range. If you notice, though, that the phonics and multisyllabic instruction is less at kindergarten and becomes a stronger fo focus, which I tried to identify through the lighter coloring. So regardless of what grade level we teach, though, we really need to start instruction where the students are. 
That may mean that a grade nine de-streamed uh, class is focused on phonics, even though that's not typical. We teach kids, not programs, and we stretch them into their grade level curriculum. And that brings us to uh, another piece that I think is really important for us to understand as teachers when it comes to learning. We have this instructional hierarchy. It applies to language and math and just learning in general. So it's important to understand because as teachers, we need to provide instruction that's tailored to students moving through each of these stages. When concepts are new or a student is struggling, we need to focus our instructional support on explicit guidance of the chunked instruction for developing the skill. Once a student has acquired the knowledge and understanding, then they need to become fluent with it before they can apply it. Remember that until a skill is fluent, all of their cognitive space is devoted to performing that skill. They don't have cognitive space to apply it until they're fluent with the knowledge and understanding. So I want to think, I want you to think about what that means when it comes to our EQAO scores that show that students have knowledge and understanding, but maybe they're struggling with thinking and application. We might need to devote instruction to fluency for these students. And lastly, once a skill is fluent, then we need to focus on opportunities to generalize and apply the skill. And that's where inquiry learning comes in. Explicit instruction is for the acquisition and fluency phases, and we may need to do some explicit instruction to directly teach the transfer of skills, but then students need practice with, with feedback, of course, to practice transferring or applying the skill to other contexts to generalize it. So those of you who have a background in ABA, you know exactly what this is all about, and it applies to all learning, not just learning for students with special needs. So the first thing that we're gonna take a look at with you today is fluency. Reading connected text is important starting in grade one and continuing beyond grade 12. Another thing that's really important is modeled fluent reading. Prior to and from grade four and up, students also need to have formal instruction and modeling in multisyllabic word reading, automaticity, prosody, and that's the uh, phrasing and expressiveness. So let's take a look at those three pieces. According to some research by Pikulski and Chard, as part of a developmental process of building decoding skills, fluency can form a bridge to reading comprehension. Language comprehension is another important skill. Language comprehension, along with vocabulary knowledge and reading fluency, combine together to get to reading comprehension. So there are three parts to fluency, accuracy, automaticity, or rate, and prosody. Decoding words repeatedly helps orthographic mapping to occur. We talked about that in part one. When letter strings or words are orthographically mapped, you no longer need to decode letter by letter, and that allows for automaticity to occur. And that's when we see rating, reading rates increase. So for example, when a student's decoding letter by letter, we'll see a lower rate or speed of reading through the text. When the words and the letter strings are orthographically mapped, the length of the word no longer contributes to how long it takes to read a text. Accuracy and automaticity both increase. And when a student's reading rate is influenced by the length of the words themselves in the text, it's an indicator, indicator for you as a teacher that orthographic mapping still needs to happen. This means there's a need to focus instruction on things like multisyllabic instruction and on fluency instruction and blending. We usually do not see prosody until the student has achieved some automaticity. And that's just because the cognitive load is too high to add in prosody or expression when the automaticity isn't there. Improving fluency requires instruction as well as practice reading connected texts at the right level with corrective feedback. And this instruction needs to focus on the three areas and working on one usually means working on the other simultaneously. So for example, if an increase in accuracy will also improve reading rate and an increase in rate will probably improve prosody since students can now pay attention to it. So common causes of disfluency include needs in phonemic awareness, decoding, vocabulary, language syntax, and background content knowledge, all the things that we've been talking about in these two webinars. Okay, so we are using in our board the ORF, um, and it's something that you can use from various different uh, places. And the ORF measures rate and accuracy. It's done by norms. And so when you're using it, 10 words above or below the 50th percentile are all normal or appropriate. Once you get to grade six, though, you'll notice when you're looking at ORF um, norms, they level out and you don't actually see a lot of difference. So that means that using a grade eight ORF in a grade 11 or grade 12 for students who are not yet fluent is actually a reliable measure of fluency and their level of risk. 
it's more difficult to measure prosody reliably because it's more subjective. So using the ORF assessment helps you to know if students are at risk for reading difficulties and to make instructional decisions. Not every student needs a lot of fluency instruction, but the assessment using an ORF will tell you who does. Accuracy is one dimension of fluency. Students need to be accurate to have automaticity. The accuracy score of students will help you to know if the text you're using is right for them. You wanna use a grade level ORF text and calculate the accuracy. When the strategies that you're using have less teacher involvement, then you need to be using an independent level of text, which is a text with which they can achieve 95 to 100% accuracy. So ORF helps you with that. When the teacher is involved with reading the text, then you can use an instructional level of text, which is a text where they can achieve 90 to 94% accuracy. If they can't achieve 90 to 94% accuracy with the text you're using, the cognitive load is too high and they won't learn what you're teaching because they have no cognitive space to work with and move it into long-term memory. They're not able to consistently follow along with the read aloud with these texts. And it's really important that reading along with you as you practice and model fluency is super important for them. They need to see and hear the text simultaneously. So if a student is struggling with accuracy, here are some things you can do. You might wanna do a diagnostic assessment like the core phonics to figure out what skills are not yet mastered. You're gonna start teaching those skills and provide opportunities to generalize them once they're mastered. You'll need to implement explicit and systematic phonics instruction for decoding. Um, at this age, they need that to focus on multisyllabic word reading with morphology. And you wanna do this across subjects, not just in language class. So here's a picture of one of the slides that we used in our part one webinar when going over how to do multisyllabic word reading instruction, just to remind you and give you an opportunity to be able to go back and take a look at that if you need to. There may be some focus on phonemic awareness for students that are this old, but once you're in grade one, research doesn't support doing only phonemic awareness. You always wanna focus on the phonemic awareness connected to the grapheme, the letter sound correspondence and the blending. Decodable texts are designed to apply the skills that you're using. And so if your school doesn't have enough decodables, you might wanna try out the AI generated project read text. There's a link for you there on the slide. And then just in case you do have students that are struggling with accuracy, these again are just some slides to remind you to go back to part one that we did at the Educators Institute in August to review those slides. In addition to the one with the last slide to just give you a visual of what multisyllabic word reading instruction looks like. Automaticity is about the rate of reading. We don't want it to be too fast and we don't want students to rush. We want it to be read at the speed at which you would speak normally and read with accuracy. Automaticity is scored as words correct per minute. The ORF gives you a score on this. If a student's struggling with automaticity, you're gonna to wanna to use some assisted reading strategies like timed repeated oral reading or self-timed repeated oral reading in order to support student developing uh, automaticity. The text should also be at their independent level to do those strategies. Remember, that's a text where they can immediately achieve 95 to 100% accuracy. So we're gonna learn a little bit more about assisted reading strategies for developing fluency in a few minutes. But for struggling readers, you should also provide explicit and systematic instruction of word reading strategies through, again, multisyllabic decoding instruction and practice in grades four to 12. There's a link here to the Florida Center for Reading Research. The link takes you to the grade four and five page, but note, it's not just for grade four and five. Those activities can be used at any age for students struggling with fluency. Okay, and then fluency is the ability to read text with automaticity, accuracy, and good prosody. Having prosody involves being able to chunk words into appropriate phrases of meaningful units based on the syntactic features of the text. With fluency itself, having prosody helps students to achieve greater comprehension of text, and which is really the ultimate goal of reading. When it comes to prosody, you measure five things, and you usually use a rubric for that. Because of that, measures of prosody are not as reliable, but it's the best we can do. It's hard to measure both words correct per minute for automaticity and prosody at the same time. It may be helpful to record a student or do a separate reading where you can just focus on prosody, or maybe you can do it all at once. I have a hard time with that. Here are the five things though that you can measure using the rubric. So there would be stress, listening to how they emphasize various words, um, 
there's phrasing, listening to the student's phrasing and indicating the length of pauses between phrases. Intonation, which is noting how the student uses end mark punctuation to guide their intonation. And expression, note that student's expression when reading the dialogue, um, does it use vocal tone appropriately? And pauses, Do, does the student pause for punctuation such as commas and end marks? When a student struggles with prosody, there are a lot of things we can do, and many of them involve teacher modeling through read aloud and think aloud. You'll need to emphasize intonation, phrasing, and appropriate pacing while you do read alouds and think alouds. You'll need to provide explicit instruction for those things and also explicit instruction of language comprehension elements like grammar, syntax, and sentence structure. Anne-Marie is going to be taking us through a deeper dive on some of that in a few minutes. You can also use assisted reading strategies like echo reading, where students copy the teacher's fluent reading. Using frequent choral reading also helps. For specific needs, you can use specific strategies. For example, you might want to use phrase cued reading if they inappropriately group words into phrases. You want to teach multisyllabic word reading if they're, if they're reading word by word. And if they're talking just in conversation, non-prosodically, then you might actually need to provide some oral language instruction for their speech to be able to help their reading. Your speech and language pathologist can help with that. If there's no intonation, another thing you can do is to model punctuation with appropriate intonation. Again, all explicit strategies. A lot of people think that independent silent reading supports fluency and vocabulary development, but there's no evidence that shows that it is that either independent reading or round robin reading supports either fluency or reading achievement. And the vocabulary that you learn from independent reading is very limited in comparison to how much you can learn through explicit instruction of vocabulary. Poor readers need to read connected text every day with a fluent adult who can provide both affirmative and corrective feedback. That's not to say that you should do not do any independent reading, just know what it does and does not support. And then make sure that the text is the appropriate independent level for the student who's reading it. So again, 95 to 100% accuracy for independent. Students really need to internalize a fluent model of reading so that they can monitor their own reading metacognitively by comparing their reading to this fluent model. So we talked about it before, but assisted reading models, they support this for development of fluency. You can do them independently of each other, or you can string them together um, using different assisted models to support practice in gradual release with the same or with related texts. Basically, there are three types of assisted reading that you can do. There's teacher assisted reading, which is usually done as a read aloud. It's important for students to see the text and they should the teacher should be modeling and thinking aloud about their reading, including prosody. Another type is peer assisted reading, which uh, is more fluent, usually paired with less fluent readers. But pair the strongest with the middle and then work down to the middle being paired with the student struggling the most. Then the last one is audio assisted reading or sometimes called reading with recordings. Because they're working without an adult supporting for this one, you really need to make sure that the recorded text is at the student's independent level. So 95 to 100% accuracy and make sure that there are no sound effects or music that the recording has adequate prosody and it's slow enough for the student to keep up. Listening alone does not build fluency. Students need to see the words as they hear them being read. You need to also be using text passages that are at the student's level and between 50 to 200 words in length. So use a variety of genre and consider common theme-based vocabulary texts. And how do you do it? Read with expression and enthusiasm, draw attention to how the passage is read and demonstrate examples and non-examples. Students can read a passage until a certain level of fluency is reached, like over and over again. So maybe you wanna pick 90 words correct per minute, or they can read it a set number of times, like three to four times. The number four has actually been shown to have the most benefit because any repetitions after four continue to help, but they don't increase exponentially after four times like it does up to four times. So students can be grouped in many ways when you're doing this and you wanna match your instruction and groupings to the student needs based on the level of gradual release. And when I say that, I mean, I do, we do, you do. Remember that you do still has teacher affirmative and corrective feedback as part of it too. So lots of different things that we can do here, uh, timed repeated oral reading, 
self-timed repeated oral reading, partner reading. Um, we're going to look more closely at phrase cued reading in a minute. Reader's theater, radio reading, choral reading, du sorry, duet reading, uh, echo reading, and reading with recordings. So let's take a look at uh, the next one. So according to Hennessy, the proficient reader uses phrasing to mirror spoken language and convey meaning. The teacher models the parsing or separating out of sentences based on syntactic patterns common to our language. In other words, we initially parse sentences by nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbial and prepositional phrases, and then by clauses reflecting units. That means that we have to have provided grammar instruction on those parts of speech and those types of phrases. We separate the text out into those syntactic units. And when I say syntactic units, another way to say that is just meaningful chunks. So Amory is going to do more with you on this. The strategy uh, for phrase key reading uses a visual means to show the parsing out of those syntactic units. So the strategy of phrase cued text, which is also known as phrase text, assists developing and struggling students with both their fluency and comprehension by focusing on one of the key areas of prosody known as juncture or appropriate text phrasing. Students, students have shown that using phrase cue text can facilitate reading performance as it helps focus students on the phrasing and chunking of text in general. So in turn, students who have better phrasing while they read often increase their comprehension of the given text. Phrase cued text obviously enhances fluency, but it also actually impacts their comprehension. One of the characteristics of a disfluent reader is that they read word by word, focusing a lot on decoding. Decoding can become so difficult that the reader cannot easily process and understand the text. By actually using these phrasal units, the phrase carries the meaning within the, within the discourse. So the comprehension increases as the student's able to process the chunk text. So although they may not have uh, word recognition abilities, the student can actually uh, read the student, sorry, with reading difficulties can actually uh, understand things better by using the area of phrasing and reading through those kind of as chunked pieces. So before beginning the strategy, you would explain to your students the importance of phrasing or chunking the, uh, the text into pieces that reflect the natural rhythm of speaking. You want to take time to model effective phrasing and don't forget to include some non-examples of good phrasing to remind them of the difference. Invite students to discuss the differences they hear between fluent and disfluent reading, especially focusing on phrasing. And you wanna use authentic text, no more than 100 to 250 words. And you wanna make a copy of the text and prepare it with these phrase marks or slash marks. So one slash mark would be used in between phrases within the text, and that would just be the one slash. And two slashes would be used kind of at, uh, in between sentences the two slashes would kind of show that there was a longer pause than the single slash. So when you're delivering a short lesson, which would be like 10 to 15 minutes a day on the phrase cue text strategy, you'd focus either individual students or small groups who need assistance with comprehension and fluency. Some of the content area teachers could also use that strategy to help students who are struggling and in need of fluency and comprehension assistance during their classroom conference or, or even lab time in a science class. So here are some examples of what phrase cued text would look like in various subject areas. So the steps that you would follow, and you can see that, that, that it's been marked on the text, would be to make a copy of the text and prepare it with the phrase marks, the slash marks, and give each student a copy of the phrase cued text. You'd remind students of the importance of reading with prosody and phrasing instead of reading word by word. You'd explain the phrasing marks to students. You'd read the text orally to the students and then read the text orally with the students emphasizing the phrases that's teacher assisted. Have students read the text orally with a partner, there's peer assisted. Discuss the students reading of the text for the purposes of assessing their comprehension, discuss the content of the text. And the next class, you might actually provide students with a copy of the original text without the phrase marks and have the students practice reading the text again. That could be done as a partner reading. You could start the class with an echo reading first if you wanted to, and then do the partner reading. Those are just examples of how you would use the various assisted reading strategies that we just looked at using the same text through instruction and practice to support students' fluency and development. So assessing the use of the phrase cued strategy can be done by observing students' oral reading using a rubric, 
and uh, giving students time to practice the strategy while also making sure that they have the opportunity to discuss and answer questions about the text they're reading. All of those are going to be really key to increasing comprehension and fluency because we know that fluency is very highly correlated with uh, comprehension, especially when we're talking about prosody. So fluency is a great thing to be able to support. However, fluency instruction on its own is not enough. Students' generalized language comprehension skills are a necessary part of both fluency and comprehension. We have to teach, model, and practice language comprehension skills so that students can apply them with automaticity when reading text. So next part is Anne-Marie's gonna be talking to you about the syntax and semantics specifically today that you'd be teaching. Okay, so thank you, Karen. Um, I think the idea of syntax, syntax and sentence structure will make a lot of sense now, especially when we're linking it to prosody. It seems to really develop our understanding of why uh, these two things contribute to comprehension. Um, so the first thing that we need to know uh, is with reading comprehension, students who know more about sentence construction tend to do better on measures of reading comprehension. An awareness of syntax helps students to find and clarify meaning within and between sentences. We know that skilled readers require an awareness of cohesive devices um, and connectives, and we'll talk about those terms in a little bit, and that skilled sentence comprehension deepens a reader's understanding, and it allows students to access more complex texts. So while we are working with decodable texts, it's still very important to give our students experiences with rich texts that, that have complex sentence structure. I just really like this quote. Um, the sentence lies at the heart of communicating thought and meaning, whether you are the writer or the reader. Syntax allows for the creation of an infinite number of sentences that serve as the worker bees of text. So when we're talking about syntax, we're focusing on the structure for ordering and organizing ideas within a sentence. Uh, the idea of grammar also becomes important as syntax must follow the rules that govern a language. So syntax, we know, is a primary obstacle to effective listening and reading comprehension. Um, the worker bees of syntax um, are those syntactic forms and functions that we will talk about. Okay, so you've probably heard time and time again that there are many contributing components to skilled reading um, or to skilled reading comprehension. The reader must make meaning from explicit information, implicit information, and at the same time, grasp word meanings, relationships between words and phrases. It's really a complex task. So this visual shows us the components that make up comprehension. We have surface code, um, where students must grasp literal and surface level details of the text. Um, this can include understanding of words, sentences, basic structure without diving deeply into the meaning of the text. The text base is where we go beyond the surface and it involves understanding relationships between ideas and the overall structure of the text. It includes how different parts of the text are connected and how they support the overall message. Um, when readers are working at the text-based level, they're focused on understanding underlying meaning and organization of the information. And of course, we know we need to bring our background knowledge and knowledge of text structure um, as well in order to move to very skilled comprehension. Um, this slide provides you with a link to a document that comes with the language curriculum. So um, this also is included in the DSTREAM grade nine English curriculum. And I think it does a really nice job of showing a continuum of grammar concepts and syntax. Um, it stresses the importance of emphasizing these conventions through oral communication, reading and writing. And it recognizes that skill development will first be emphasized through that oral communication. And eventually it'll be applied when students are reading and hopefully in their writing. Um, the appendix will give you a sequence of skills. Um, so we want to find out where our students are at in this continuum. And I think we know that we probably have many students who, who may not be where they need to be. So this is what makes it all that more important to go right back to the foundation of syntax and grammar concepts. 
Um, so when Karen's talking about prosody and she's talking about grouping um, phrases into meaningful chunks, this really resonates, I think, with this slide. So the idea of idea units within a sentence, within a sentence, there are many different ideas that we're combining together to make meaning. So the connection between idea units is found within this structure. We need to emphasize sentence level work so that we can enable our students to find meaning within and between. The reader needs to figure out the logical relationship between words and phrases, and then understand how those relationships and idea units are covered through different types of sentences. So here's a nice overwhelming list for everyone of some of the concepts that, that we need to cover. So notice that we have included the parts of speech, sentence types, the different sentence structures, sentence level concepts, including different types of phrases and clauses. Um, and without becoming lost in the terms, we wanna really focus on function. So the terminology can become important, but overall we wanna focus on function. So for example, at a foundational level, you might focus on the concept of subject predicate, and maybe you're not calling it subject and predicate. Maybe we're talking about a part that names a who or what, and a part that tells more about what who or what did. Um, eventually, it becomes handy to have some common terminology so that we can talk to students as they progress through the grades, uh, more specifically about parts of sentences. Um, so first we'll talk about parts of speech because the parts of speech are really the foundation of grammar. So in past, in, in past years, we've moved away, I think, from explicitly teaching about these parts of speech, but I think they're making a comeback, and I think there's a really good reason for that. So when we know the parts of speech, we are able to build coherent, grammatically correct sentences. Readers need to understand how individual words are related in order to make sense of text. And as I said before, in order to truly understand a sentence, students need to know how different words work together um, in order to produce meaning. So I'm not suggesting that we move to rote memorization of all of the grammar rules and definitions of each term. That's probably not going to help our students to truly understand how each word brings meaning. But we need to focus on the function of those parts of speech and in context whenever possible. Uh, we can examine the function of words within sentences, both simple and complex. Um, here's a strategy, just a suggested framework for intentional instruction in sentence structure and grammar concepts. So this approach here is um, adapted from William Van Cleve's Writing Matters. Uh, there's a link, I believe, on this slide if you're interested in that. Uh, when instructing students in concepts related to syntax, we need to take a direct instruction approach, just as we do with all concepts in structured literacy. Um, so first, and this doesn't appear on this slide, but you're going to introduce the new concept, um, or it could be a concept of review. And when you introduce it, you might have a student create, say, a flashcard, where on one side you would have the term. And then you may have a student-friendly definition on the back side, but more importantly, you have some examples on the back side. And this is the card that students can keep accessing um, when it comes time to practice. And just a suggestion, if you have students that benefit from the use of technology, you might use a digital tool like Quizlet. Um, that way they're not going to lose these cards and uh, it's easily accessible. Then uh, we move into the strategies that you see here and progress students through activities that show deeper understanding of a concept. So first, you would start with a sort. You're going to have students sort target words um, or sentence parts into different categories. So for example, maybe you're giving various nouns, verbs, and adverbs, and you want students to sort them into those categories. Um, this is going to tell us if students understand the function of the new concept. Then from there, uh, we move to identify. So we would have them actually identify examples of this concept in a larger context. So typically here you want to use professionally written sentences from textbooks, good literature. You can access um, material from your own classroom library. And then we want students to identify these examples across those contexts. And then we'd move to create, um, and this is where it becomes really student-centered. So students are going to create their own examples 
in isolation. So students must focus primary attention on creating examples of the concept or the words or the phrases. Um, and then also, eventually we move them into a more applied context where maybe they're showing you a sentence and they're able to show you the noun within that sentence. Finally, we'd move to share. So here students will share their examples with the instructor and with the classmates. And this is a really powerful tool for the instructor to know whether or not students are grasping the concept. So this activity is going to validate students' writing. It's going to encourage them to write at a more sophisticated level because they're anticipating that um, they have an audience. And then again, it allows the instructor to check for competence. Um, Student-generated examples are what's most important here. And then we move to examples and non-examples where, again, the focus is on those examples that the students have created. Here, the instructor would use the examples, both correct and incorrect, um, so that they can clarify. And if further instruction is needed, this is the time um, that's going to happen. So as students share, the teacher would write any incorrect examples as well as um, examples that maybe dive a little more deeply into the concept, or if an interesting point comes up, we want to include that um, for discussion. And I don't know if some of you have seen this before. This is uh, something that I think was done extensively in the past, but this is sentence diagramming. Um, putting all of the words of a sentence on a sentence diagram focuses our learners to identify connections between different parts of the sentence. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big task, and I think you need to start out uh, with, a, with simple sentences to begin, uh, but it really is a powerful tool in getting students to understand how different words within the sentence connect to other words. So uh, diagramming forces learners to identify these connections, and you can do this through connections with words, but also we're going to get into um, our different sentence structure. So to start out basic, you're going to have subject, um, either noun or pronoun, and then a main predicate verb. From there, um, you would add direct objects and indirect objects, then you would add prepositions. Um, these might not be found next to the words that they modify when we're talking about prepositions, so that can be a little bit trickier for students. And then we can add modifiers and articles. So again, these can get quite complex. Um, I'd recommend just doing a Google search of this strategy, or if you can find a core resource that takes you step by step through the process, um, I really do think that this will support students' understanding of how words are connected. And this is a nice little segue into the importance then of teaching the four types of sentence structure because it can get quite complex. So in order for students to relate words and ideas within a sentence, they must have an understanding of the four types of sentence structure. We want students to understand what makes a complete sentence for their own writing, but they must also understand the challenges that complex sentences can pose when they're trying to understand what they're reading. So in order to get students writing in more complex sen sentence structure, there are strategies, strategies and activities that can help, and I'm going to speak to that uh, afterwards. These are your four sentence types. I'll just bring your attention to um, the compound, complex, and compound complex sentences. You'll probably notice that it's important for students to understand phrases and clauses in this case, which brings us to this. So. Um, I'm sure many of us have complained that we have students that seem to write um, sentence fragments or run-ons, and it continues and continues. One way to address that is to really dive into what um, phrases and clauses are and how they work within a sentence. So um, even in my grade 10 academic English class, one of the things that, that I often saw were students writing um, fragments because they put a dependent, uh, because they had a dependent clause. Um, so then we need to really dive deeply into those cohesive ties. We need to look at uh, connectives. We need to look at conjunctions um, and just dive more deeply into these pieces of the sentence. Uh, we need to be aware as well that when a sentence contains many ideas, or if it has unusual word order, this can be confusing. Um, even a single word, a connector like and, 
but, so, or a cohesive device where we've used a pronoun to refer to, um, say, a person that we already mentioned, that can really throw students off. Um, this chart comes from Hennessy and it emphasizes that we need to plan for instruction, but we also need to plan for incidental, but still on purpose instruction. So we know that through reading experiences like shared reading, group and independent reading, we want to make sure that we're still bringing um, the attention to what it is that we're teaching around syntax. Uh, here are some activities that you could use within the classroom, and I'll show you a couple examples of how these work. Um, you can integrate this in reading and writing activities when you're focusing on syntax. These activities here put an emphasis on the relationship among words in a sentence, and then it increases our students' ability to monitor their understanding of syntax when they're reading a text, um, and eventually they can apply this in their own writing. Here's an example of um, a couple more activities that you might want to access. The sentence expansion is a powerful one um, and really is able to show you students' understanding of uh, perhaps a text that they've just read that comes from the writing revolution. There are sentence anagrams where you have like a word scramble and we're going to um, make a meaningful sentence based on the words that are put in front of us. And sometimes you can move some words around and it still works, but brings new meaning to the sentence. Um, here's an activity that some of you may have already done in your classrooms, uh, sentence elaboration. But the nice thing about this activity is it really gets students to focus on word function. Um, so when we have questions like, where did she swim? Or when? We can start connecting those with parts of speech and bring awareness to the function of those parts of speech. Um, here's an advanced sentence elaboration example where you start with your noun and verb and notice this does start to make you think of the, the sentence diagram that we saw before. Um, here we're asking students to add articles and adjectives. They need to be aware of predicates so that they can elaborate on predicate, add adverbs, add a phrase. And to get even more complex, we can get them to focus on complex sentence structure, um, creating compound sentences, and so on. Um, another activity worth mentioning is formal frames that you can find um, on the Literacy How website. So there's a link here as well. Um, this strategy supports sentence comprehension and syntax. Focus here is on, <coughs> excuse me, students building a complete sentence. Um, we can target academic phrases like, in my opinion, and the amount of scaffolding that can be provided with the formal frame sets most of our students up for success. So we're going to provide examples. We're going to point out grammatical expectations, <laughs> whether it be an adjective, um, a present tense verb. In giving them um, a word bank, that also is a scaffold that would help to support some of our students who maybe just aren't there yet um, in being able to identify the parts of speech. <clears throat> then we have sentence combining. Um, just a note, there is um, a great tool, quill.org, that does a wonderful job of um, giving you lessons around sentence combining and provides activities for students that can be done online um, or on paper. So whenever we anticipate that students may struggle with lengthier sentences, we want to bring awareness to that through incidental instruction. Often students are encountering these types of sentences. And what's interesting here, and um, the example sentence that I've used here was pulled actually from an OSSLT article, and it's currently embedded in the online practice test. So here I've selected a sentence um, that's th that I can break down into two sentences, and then I'm going to ask my students to focus on the subordinating conjunction. I might give them the word although if I want them to really hone in on that. Or I might give them a couple of options to see, do they really understand the meaning of although in connecting these two ideas? Um, I'm going to have to probably 
just plow through a couple of these slides, but um, they should give you a good idea of all of the activities, um, all of the steps of these activities, and they're fairly easily accessible if you search online or in the links here. Um, one thing we need to be aware of is the complexity of sentences. So when we're presenting a text to our students, we want to preview that text and decide what is going to be difficult for them. Some of the, the things that we really want to watch out for is the length of sentences, the distance between the subject and the verb or the predicate, um, the number of clauses, uh, if we have advanced connectives, words like however, despite, although, uh, that can be really tricky. And I'd argue that maybe it would be a good idea to take some of those words and present them as your tier two vocabulary words when you're doing vocabulary instruction. So here are a couple of examples. Um, and you might reflect on some of the types of questions that you might ask to get students to hone in on the function of particular words or phrases. So you can see um, in the first example, we have a noun phrase expansion. So in general, we know that longer sentences are likely to be more difficult for our students to understand. Um, in this case, we can identify where the noun is, but we can see that there are quite a few modifiers to that noun. So when you look at fire, for example, you can see that it's the three alarm fire. Um, as you move down to building, we, we have apartment building before it, and then we have this relative clause that uh, we just completed last year. So we want to be aware of these. We want to bring um, students' attention to this and really work through that um, based on some of the uh, instruction that we've previously done in our classroom. Um, interestingly, subordinating conjunctions, if we're looking at example number two, are actually introduced on that language document uh, that I showed you before in the continuum in grade two. So keep in mind that this can happen orally as well, um, but this idea is introduced in grade two, but is in the consolidation phase up to grade eight and then being refined in grade nine. Um, when we get into the idea of dependent clauses, that's introduced in grade four, according to, to that chart. So just something to be aware of, uh, because I do think some of our students would struggle to understand this. Um, in the third example, you have an adverbial clause. So we need students to understand those the, the importance of words like after there. They also need to understand how the punctuation affects this sentence. Um, and in example four, we have a relative clause. We have some distance then between the woman who is sitting over there and the fact that that woman is my neighbor. I'll just give you a moment to take a look at these examples here. Um, just to think about these embedded clauses, um, what's going to make this really difficult for students to understand and what kind of questions we might be able to ask to help clarify. Um, in speaking about connectives and their functions, we need to teach the function of various connecting words. We need to provide exposure in texts that present them and use our evidence-based strate strategies listed here to build students' awareness. And finally, cohesive ties. This is really a powerful concept in terms of sentence comprehension. We need to create opportunities to explicitly teach these, um, these cohesives to our students. We need to talk about the meaning. We need to show them many, many examples of what they could look like. This is all about exposure. And exposure in multiple subject areas is just going to benefit our students. Um, then we need to empower our students to recognize when these cohesive ties are causing confusion so that they can then take it upon themselves to, to correct that, to understand what's actually happening within the sentence. I've listed a few um, of the top tips here. Just a couple of things that um, I think are worth bringing attention to is that um, we don't want to forget that when instructing in syntax, we should look at oral and written modalities. We want to integrate reading and writing and provide direct instruction around these concepts. 
Um, and finally, um, I just wanted to bring your attention to the fact that um, OSSLT does touch on these concepts. So currently I'm working within a high school. Um, so this is really relevant to the work that I'm doing, but it becomes apparent just how important it is to be teaching these concepts of syntax and sentence structure because students are going to see this. And I'll give it back to Karen so that we can touch on writing very briefly. Great. So I know our focus today was really on reading, but we wanted to kind of tie it all together as well with giving you the writing learning progression. So if you notice how the reading instruction that we've outlined in these sessions also actually serve to support the learning progression of writing. So although we're not really talking about writing yet, it is really important to understand the connection of what you're teaching and practicing and reading to writing instruction. So hopefully that uh, learning progression will be helpful for you. Okay, so today we wanted to take a deeper dive into some of the areas of reading that people may be less familiar with. All of the parts of the reading rope are important for instruction, as you saw in one of our first slides that outlines the grade levels at which we're instructing those elements. We recommend that you come back often to that visual model of Scarborough's reading rope that we have here. It helps us to see the many different dimensions of skills that we're needing to explicitly instruct so that students can learn to read. It also helps us to understand the complex and interconnected nature, I think, of reading and writing skills. It illustrates how various components of reading and writing are interwoven and in contributing to the overall language proficiency of our students. So for example, strong word recognition skills in reading directly translate to accurate spelling or encoding and word choice in writing. Writers draw on their ability to decode words, to spell them correctly, and to use them like to use appropriate vocabulary in their compositions. Writers also rely on their language comprehension skills like background knowledge, vocabulary knowledge, reasoning, literacy knowledge, syntactic awareness, which is grammar and sentence structure, and semantic understanding. All of those things go together to create meaningful and coherent texts. And a deep understanding of the vocabulary, grammar, syntax, and sentence structure really helps readers to comprehend and writers to be able to convey the ideas effectively in their reading, in their written work. And then lastly, it's just the rope weaving, the intertwined strands of the rope really show how the reading and writing skills reinforce each other. Progress in one strand can influence progress in the other strands, which gives us that continuous and reciprocal relationship between reading and writing abilities and the importance of oral language to all of it. So as students become better readers with a strong foundation in language comprehension and word recognition, their writing skills often improve as well. Similarly, as students develop stronger writing skills, they gain deeper understanding of written language, which can enhance the reading comprehension. So we hope that we've provided you with a deeper understanding of that today. And then that takes us to the end. Um, we always welcome questions and um, we've provided our contacts for you in case you would like to reach out. Uh, we don't want you to hesitate to reach out. I think the more we're talking about this across the province, the better. So we really hope that today's two areas of focus are going to be helpful to you in determining the focus of your instruction for students who are struggling with reading fluency and with comprehension. And we want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Karen and Anne-Marie. That was very informative, at least to me. <laughs> I hope our audience feels the same way. Um, so we do have time for a little question period. I'm still monitoring the chat and the Q&A, but I'll just jump right into things here. Um, I guess my first question, you should have seen my face light up when the uh, diagramming of sentences came up because I was a linguistics major in university and we did that a lot. And it was one of my favorite activities, like a little puzzle of words, but that was third year university for me. Uh, what do you do for the teachers who might not have been so explicitly taught in grammar and diagramming sentences and all these things, subjects, predicates, objects, direct objects, where would you send educators to learn more about grammar for themselves first before introducing the class to them? 
Um, I'm one of those people as well. I think I didn't, I didn't get a lot of formal grammar instruction in English. I was in French immersion. So I think I had the benefit of being able to hone in a bit more on those grammar concepts. Um, but it's, it's huge. It's a lot of information. Um, personally, I think starting out um, small is probably the most important thing. Um, I think for myself, uh, quill.org is a really great place to go where you have some scripted lessons that will help you first move into ideas of sentence combining, um, particularly if you're teaching, say, above uh, the sixth grade. Um, I don't know, Karen, if there's another resource you might want to point out. Yeah, I think there are lots of resources, especially online. Um, there's also Logic of English that gives you some some background kinds of things around some of the grammar and, and vocabulary pieces that are important too. Wonderful. Um, and then the question of webinars like this is, how do you do this with a class of 30 students where one student is way ahead of the rest or one student is really dragging behind the rest? How do you manage that in, in a regular classroom? Well, I think the thing is, is that when it comes to these needs, uh, like we have not been teaching this stuff consistently across the province for a, you know, a really long time. And so I think that when you're seeing that one or two students need it, the rest of the students are going to benefit from it. And we really need to start thinking about how what we're providing as our core and how we design our lessons to be inclusive is about favoring the opportunities of uh, kids whose opportunities may be compromised. So rather than thinking of it as, you know, one or two students that need it, when one or two students need it, it should be part of your regular instruction. We're talking about like a, a little two minute bell work kind of piece that's actually going to help everybody. So um, when it comes to those big classes, I think that you, you want to do some of these kinds of things and incorporate them even as some bell work. I think there are, there is a hierarchy of skills, especially um, Susanna talking about uh, sentence diagramming. It can get very complex. Yes. Um, so I think that would lend itself to um, some students maybe working just with simpler sentences, whereas others are getting into compound complex. Um, it, it really does offer a wide range of skills for students. Thank you. Um, so you brought up complexity there, which brings me to another question. I think with the earlier grades, it's very easy to look at a book and see if this is, you know, a difficult to decode. Have we worked on those skills yet? This is too complex for my student. But later on, when it's grammar complexity, how do you gauge that as a teacher that this is an appropriate book to be reading with my student? I think our students all need um, exposure to rich language and and complex sentence structure. Um, in terms of what's appropriate, I think you need to think age appropriate, grade appropriate. Um, but complex sentences are they they might seem scary at first, but I think um, it's it's important that we give our kids the opportunity to see that and to talk about it. Um, I don't know, Karen, if there's anything further you wanted to add. Yeah, no, I just think listening comprehension is a big part of it as well, right? Like it's never a never a problem to try something out that you think is maybe too complex where you're not necessarily wanting them to be developing fluency from it um, when it comes to word reading, but actually just listening to the text and having the conversation around some of that more complex text is really important. I think that's what we saw in one of those first slides where we saw that across like all that time period, Oral language is a big piece for all of the different language comprehension pieces. Yeah. Um, I will have, we've got time for, I mean, we're really pushing it, but I'll ask a couple more. Um, I know in later grades, a lot of the time and effort in, in an English language class would be focused on interpretation of the text and comprehension. What's the proper balance between you know, fluency and vocabulary and syntax instruction, these very practical things, and then the more creative side of things of interpreting text and understanding the intention of the author. How much time do you spend on each of those things? I don't think that there's a magic answer to that. 
Yeah. I think that for me, I would start with the data that you have about that particular group of students and where do their needs start and focus your attention on some of those parts where they're behind so that you're spending more time to catch them up. I don't know, Amory, if you have something else. I mean, so I'm I'm in a regular high school right now and um, I have a range of learning strategies classes to um, English classes where there are lower level um, reading skills, I would say, and academic level as well. Um, and in all cases, I try to incorporate um, at least something from our, our structured literacy, the, the different components of structured literacy every day. So whether it be um, morphology, we're looking at morphemes, um, and that can just be a five minute activity, um, whether it be let's let's use like a mentor sentence and let's unpack this together today. Um, I think starting out in, you know, five to 10 minutes, just give yourself five to 10 minutes to try something out each day. Um, I know the whole piece of, of critical thought and getting kids to really dive deeply and in, infer meaning in text is important, but they're going to struggle with that if they don't have these skills to support that understanding. Mm. All right. One last question before I let everyone go for the day. Um, Karen, you you had a perfect sound bite at the beginning. We teach kids, not programs. I, I stole that quote and put it on our Twitter already. But of course, it always comes back to what programs would you suggest? Are there any programs around fluency and syntax and grammar and all these things? So unfortunately, no, there aren't okay. like comprehensive programs that we've been able to find around that. Um, not not specific to some of those things. There are some things that are coming out of the states that have uh, some great effect sizes and some evidence base behind them. And I anticipate that because that's coming that hopefully we will see them more um, in Canada as well as some of our publishers start working in that. But uh, the thing is, is I think that you need to know all of those different pieces and we really have to take a very piecemeal approach right now because there isn't one comprehensive resource that's going to cover all of that for you. Wish there was. I know, don't we all? <laughs> All right. Well, that is all we have time for today. So we're going to have to end the webinar at this point. But if you're pondering this tonight and more ideas pop into your head, you can always get in touch with us. Um, email us anytime, info at ldatschool.ca um, or reach out to us on Twitter. The easiest way is using that hashtag that we always use for our webinars. And we will endeavor to get every question we ever receive answered, but particularly around this webinar. So on behalf of the team, I'd once again like to thank Amory and Karen for this presentation. We're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat from the audience, which is lovely to see. Um, for our participants, thank you for joining us. I know you're very busy people and it means a lot to me and our presenters and the whole team that you show up for these webinars. Uh, please remember, we'll be sending out the presentation slides and a short survey, as well as a link to the preliminary recording of this webinar tomorrow morning. So look at your inboxes for an email from me. Um, if you do have time to do the survey, we really encourage you to do that because it provides really important feedback for us in planning future webinars and in picking topics for the Educators Institute this summer, which I hope everyone will be a part of. And that is all I have to say today. So thank you again for participating and enjoy your evenings. You are dismissed.